So if you would get your Bibles this morning and turn with me to the book of Matthew on this Palm Sunday, the book of Matthew in the 21st chapter. Let me just start off the way they tell you in college not to start off a sermon. Let me ask you a question. Who is Jesus to you? There are a lot of different answers that people come up with. There were a lot of people in Jesus' day that came up with a lot of different answers. But not, I guess, this morning, who is Jesus? What is it you want him to be? What is your expectation of Jesus in your life? You see, we would come and say that maybe we don't have expectations, but if we really think about it, we all have some sort of expectation of Jesus, of God, in our own life. And this morning, I think, perspective is going to be the key that is going to help us to be able to see Jesus for what he was then and what he is now. And what we think about him in our own mind can dictate a lot of the actions that we take in our own life and how we live and how we follow him. And so this morning, that would be my question to you, would simply be this. Who is Jesus, and what do you expect from him? It's not a hard question to ask, but it sometimes can be much more difficult to answer. So let's look here in this 21st chapter of Matthew, and let's, uh, let's see what Scripture says to us this morning. As they approached Jerusalem... And came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there, and her colt by her. Untie them, and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on him, on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, those that followed, shouted, Hosanna! to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. It's a a great passage of scripture. One that... uh, can help us to think about some things in our own life, and that is, who is Jesus and what do we expect from him? The first thing I think we need to talk about this morning is is how they prepared. Jesus knew in advance what was going to happen. So uh, in preparing to, to allow that all to take place, he tells a couple of his disciples to go and get the colt. He already knew that the guy was going to send the colt, And so he tells him, if he gives you any problems, just tell him that the Lord needs him. Now, why is that phrase important in this passage of Scripture? It is the only time that Matthew refers to Jesus and uses the word Lord. John is the only time that, well, not the only time, but very one of the very few times that John ever records this entire story along with the other Gospels. This is an important passage of Scripture if all four of the Gospels are talking about it. But that phrase, the Lord, Mark uses it a couple of times. Luke uses it 16 or 17 times. But this is the only time that Matthew records the word, tell them the Lord sent them. So what is the importance of 
of having him realize it's the Lord. You see, there was a belief in that time and, and still prevalent today from the Old Testament that God was going to send a Messiah, the Lord. And in doing so, one of the signs of the Messiah was that they would ride into town on a colt. And so in saying those words, the Lord needs them, what he's saying is, is the Messiah has come. He's here. And the guy would readily give up his foal. And so he does that, and he brings it back. It's important, too, that we know that he stopped on the top of the Mount of Olives, and that the procession all starts on the Mount of Olives. That is another sign from the Old Testament, uh, and, and you can find that in some of the historical writings, that the belief was that the king would enter into Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. The Messiah would arrive and ride into town from the Mount of Olives. It's a... Uh, it's pretty impressive when you get into the background of all of this to know exactly why things happened, exactly when they happened, and how they happened, and why they had to happen in that, in that way. And so he comes and he brings the colt, and it fulfills Scripture. And it says the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them, and they brought the donkey, and they placed their cloaks on him, and then people began to think of Jesus in another way. You see, the people were so oppressed by the Roman government, they really wanted the king. They really wanted something to be done about their lifestyles and how they were oppressed and that they couldn't freely do everything that they wanted to do. Kind of sounds a little bit like today. Amen? And so they wanted a king. And so when they hear the word Messiah, they interpret the word king. Sometimes... My wife will tell me something, and I'll hear something different. You know what I'm saying? Like, could you go take the trash out, and I hear, I'm going to bake you some cookies. <laughs> Maybe not to that extreme, but occasionally she'll say something that I'll misinterpret, and I'll mess it up. And, and Well, I'm the husband. That's my job. And sometimes when we hear things and we read things in Scripture, we take them wrong, don't we? Occasionally. And these people in this town were so oppressed, and they just knew that God had promised there was a, a king going to come just like the days of old. That they interpreted Jesus as a king. So they began to lay palms in the street, and they began to, uh, to sing praises to the king. And one of the things that they, that they sang about was Hosanna to the son of David. Now, I don't know how it is in your Bible, but if you look in the bottom of my Bible, down here on the very bottom line, there's little A, Bs, you know, inside the, the verse of Scripture, and it kind of tells you what some of the words mean. On the bottom of mine, it says that Hosanna is a Hebrew expression meaning save, which became an exclamation of praise in this verse so when I read that this week I did a little more research and it also means it can also be interpreted as to mean to save or save us or save the king in this instance and so the the people were actually singing to God to save the king not save the Messiah save the king who is going to take on the Roman government and take care of all of our problems and we're going to be free people again. It's easy for us to get caught up in that cycle in our life, isn't it? And we began to view God as a candy machine. And we put our prayers in, we push the right buttons, and our answer should come out at the bottom. I believe these people began to see God in that way. I believe they began to think that God wasn't about saving their soul. He was more about saving their lifestyle. We all like to live good, don't we? We all like to have nice things. And sometimes we, in our humanness, can begin to use God as the candy machine. 
You say, boy, Lord, I really would like to have that. I can remember one time when I was about five years old, there was a neighbor kid down the street that had a five-speed bike. Had a, it was gold, and it had a black banana seat on it, and the front forks were raised up a little bit, so you kind of sit back like a chopper, and it had the bars that came up. Man, I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. I'd get a bike like that. I never got a bike like that. And sometimes I think, I use that in a light illustration, but sometimes in our lives we pray for things so hard and say, God, fix my physical life. And we begin to place more importance on the physical things of this world than we do on the spiritual things that God has intended. You understand God didn't come that you might have the grandest life on this earth physically or monetarily he came that you might be saved from all of that to realize that it's all about him and being with him I love the picture that John paints in revelations of streets of gold and jasper walls lakes of diamonds but I wonder if we realize those all represent things that we deem as valuable on this earth. I don't know that there's going to be streets of gold to walk on. I don't know that there's going to be jasper walls. I don't know that there's going to be lakes of diamonds. I don't know if we're going to live in mansions or shacks, but old buddy Robinson used to say, I just give me a shack in the back. I don't care. I'm just looking to get to heaven. And I look at it and I say, we sometimes put things in the wrong perspective. And we look at them from the wrong angle. You see, Jesus didn't come to save them from the Roman government. He came to save them from Satan. That's what he came for. But they were singing praises to him as if he were the king. The king of the Jews. I'm sure you recognize that phrase. Here in about a week from now, that will have been up on his cross. You see, they reacted and responded and lived their lives because they thought he was the king that was going to save them from the Romans. And sometimes when we begin to view God as the one who fixes all of our problems here, not to say that God doesn't work in our lives and fix problems, but when we begin to, to, to use that as a candy machine to get what we want, it changes what we do and how we live and how we view God in this life. Does that make sense to anybody? Am I making sense this morning? Okay. All right, I'm trying to walk down the middle of the street. I'm not, because the, there's a bunch of woods I could go off in. I'm trying to stay in the middle. If we allow those thoughts to begin to penetrate into our actions of how we live our life, you only walk to a car to start it. Why? Because you think it'll start and go to town, right? And your actions of going to that car, now if you knew that car wouldn't start, would you walk to that car and try to start it? No, right? So your mind determines what your body does right it determines your speech it determines your thought patterns and how you act you say boy that was a stupid illustration about a car got the point across <laughs> so if we begin to think of God in that way it will affect our spiritual lives and it will cause us to act a certain way it'll cause us to pray a certain way I wonder if we understand the concept of prayer is not just about speaking and asking for things. But prayer is supposed to be a time spent with God. Does there have to be anything come out of your mouth? No. If everything is coming out of your mouth, how is he possibly supposed to talk? And share something. Well, Lord, this is my time to talk to you. You'll just have to find time later on when I'm busy doing something else. You see, 
that kind of a thought process can cause us to think and act in ways that are unproductive in a Christian life. And that will cause us to view Jesus in a skewed manner the same way these people did in Matthew. Let's go on. It says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred. All the people that had been with him in the days beforehand, watching him do miracles, healings, uh, driving out spirits, all of those things had come to Jerusalem. They were good Jewish people. They had come for the feast, for the celebration of God and the Passover, and all of those things. And those same people were talking to other people. And when they see Jesus start coming into town on a donkey, word spreads like wildfire. Hey, you remember the guy I was telling you about that healed Sam? He's coming into town on a donkey. He's the king. And people began to flock to him because of that. It is important for us to understand. We don't come to Jesus because of that stuff. We come to Jesus because he's the only hope we have of dealing with the things in this world and making it out of this world alive. Does that make sense? It says, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked this question. You might remember it from earlier in my sermon. Who is this? Who is this Jesus? So let me just go back this morning. And let me just ask you the questions again. Who is Jesus to you? Is he the one that makes your life all better and gives you all the toys you ever wanted? Or is he the one that you go to when you need encouragement? Is he the one that you go to for forgiveness of sins? Is he the one that you go to for comforting and strength? encouragement who is he to you you see because that's going to matter it's going to matter tomorrow morning when you get out of bed and you begin to live life the work week the doldrums and all of those things how you see Jesus will dictate how you're going to act in this world So who is Jesus to you? And what do you expect out of him? I would encourage you. This is the Passion Week. And we're going to have plenty of opportunities this week to learn, to grow, to allow God to move and work in our life, to reveal himself to us in such a way that is undeniable to us of who he is I would encourage you in these next five to seven days take every opportunity be at the Methodist church on Thursday be at Wednesday night Bible study too by the way but be on church be in church on Thursday at the Methodist church be in church here on Friday be in church on sunrise morning and worship God Give him every opportunity to speak to you in a way that is undeniable, that you can't possibly miss. And when it comes to Easter service on Sunday morning, you'll know exactly who he is. And you'll find every reason to praise him. And you'll find every reason to sing his praises louder than you've ever sang. You see, that's the relationship that God wants with us. He doesn't want just the passing by or Sunday morning, oh, I <clears throat> go and sit in there for an hour. It's good enough. You see, he wants that relationship that says when you leave the door, he goes with you. And he goes with you throughout the day. And he goes to, to your room at night when you sleep. 
And he's there when you wake up. And he's there when you leave to go to work or to school or whatever it is you do. You see, he wants that relationship 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He doesn't just want us to think of him in the terms that these people thought of him. Nor does he want us to think in terms that have become relevant in our day. Who is he to you this morning? It'll make a difference of what you decide. Stand with me, would you please, this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for being our king. The king of our hearts, the king of our souls, the king of our lives. And Lord, we worship you and we praise you because of that this morning. Lord, I know sometimes our vision can get, a, can get out of whack and we can get a blurred vision of who you are and what it is you desire to be in our life and what we should expect from you. Lord, I just pray that you would use this time this week that we would allow you to have access to those areas of our life that maybe we've tried to keep the door on. Maybe we've tried to keep you and everybody else locked out of. Lord, I just pray this week that we would allow you to have access to those areas. And Lord, we just pray that you'd reveal yourself to us in such a way that we can't possibly miss it. That, Lord, it will become crystal clear to us who you are and what you desire from our lives and in our lives. Lord, help us this week to realize the great gift that you gave to us but not just the gift itself but why why you you gave that great gift to us Lord help us to realize your love this morning Lord we we love you and we give you praise and glory this morning for all that you are and all that you do you are a great a great God who loves us and cares for us this morning. Lord, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.